<laughs> I'm gonna keep that in. All right. Welcome to Psychos and Sociopaths. Today we're gonna talk about Edmond Elmil Kemper the uh, Third. He was a serial rapist, serial killer, cannibal, and necrophilia who murdered ten people. That's only in t uh, the account of it. He actually probably murdered uh, more than that. He had an IQ of 145. And he was known as the co-ed killer uh, because most of the people that he killed, most of the females, were college students. Yes, the co-ed butcher, the ogre of Aptos, the mad titan, and the one that I kind of chuckle at, and I read this to my girlfriend this morning, was Bumblebutt. <laughs> that gives a whole new meaning on that one. All right, I'm like, oh, okay, so was he gassy? You know, what's going on here? I just now looked at the, uh, I get the I guess he had a uh, voluptuous buttocks, but uh, <laughs> voluptuous sounds <lump>. like <laughs> sounds like a like a porn genre. It's like oh voluptuous, no, 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 just how about a lie? No, it's just not. Oh uh, yeah. Um, <laughs> what mostly uh, most of the people that he'd actually killed were uh, female hitchhikers during his killing and raping sp uh, raping spree. Uh, he was actually in prison twice. <clears throat> Once was uh, due to the fact that he killed his grandparents. I think it was his grandparents. Was yeah, he killed them when he was 15, yeah. Yeah, he killed them with the, uh, when he was 15. Uh, yeah, he was uh, diagnosed as a para paranoid schizophrenic by court psychiatrist and sentenced to the Atastacaro, I know I'm butchering that, state hospital as a criminally insane juvenile. They released him at 21. After he convinced psychiatrists that he was rehabilitated, and remember, this dude had an IQ of 145, so you know he knew how to work the system. Well, that was actually uh, what he said in the interview of uh, how he stayed out of the limelight so much because of the fact that he would actually talk to the cops. He wanted to be a cop. He yeah. actually took the exam, but because he was six to nine, and I don't, I don't see why that would be. A problem other than getting uniforms. Well, uniforms and being able to fit into cars, uh, and just you know the fact that, like for example, when I was in the army, I was with a in, in the army with a guy. Uh, his last name was uh, Molengraf. We called him Mo, and his nickname was Tree. Okay. Um, the dude, literally, he was like six 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 seven, and he was in the infantry, and it was it was comical because we would, you know, we'd go out to the field and <laughs> we'd have to dig you know, foxholes are fighting positions. And where the normal, the, the, the you know, we, he'd have, you, you would see the foxhole that he would be in, you could pick it out from a lineup because one side was up here and the side that he would have to occupy was dug all the way down here because the standard is up to your armpits. And it, it was just, it was, it, was, it was funny as hell to pick him out you could see him anywhere. He was in formation, marching, or whatever. Uh, he literally would stand. I mean, he would tower over everybody. And and it wasn't, I mean, he was a big boy. I mean, you could tell he was definitely corn-fed. But, I mean, he was just, this guy was just massive. <laughs> he was, I forget where he was from, but the dude was just, he just towered. So, and his uniforms were, I mean, like you'd see, he'd wear like a large regular top, and he'd have to wear large, extra, extra long trousers, you know, in his BDUs or his dress uniform, and it was it was hilarious because he could almost never find you know the right parts, and his I think he had like a size fifteen boot, so I mean this Damn. dude was massive, yeah. but it, it was I mean. Oddly enough, the dude was, God, he was a teddy bear. Um, I don't know whatever, you know, I don't know how long he stayed in or whatever, but, yeah, I mean, just the fact that he was 6'9", I mean, yeah, there, there's going to be certain general aspects as to why he wouldn't have been accepted into, you know, the normal population of police officers. But then there's the whole tactical side of it, uh, not to mention the fact that you try to fit him into a car. You know, I mean, you're, you... Nowadays, it's not so much of a problem because, you know, police officers, a lot of police departments, they, they drive uh, the Ford Explorers um, uh, SUVs. 
And so those are generally built for larger people. But back then, back in the, in the 70s, I think average height was right at... It's always been six t- uh, five ten. Yeah, it's like five ten, uh, six foot, right in that area. But I mean, he's going to add like almost an, an entire foot. I mean, you're looking at an extra foot to nine inches of average mean height, and they had nowhere to put them. So, it. it I don't want to say that they looked at it, they discriminated it against it, just because of based off of physicality. But I, I think that there was a lot of practicality to the decision making process that the police departments he applied for denied him. And it was just basically because of his height. It, with 145 IQ, the guy was obviously smart, but you can't start somebody out as a detective, you know. So it, it's <laughs> everybody has to start as a patrolman. Yeah, he actually went to a uh, uh, the jury bar. That that was the uh, bar that a lot of uh, police department actually went to to mm-hmm. actually <clears throat> uh, drink after work and everything like that. Uh, Apparently, he was diagnosed as also a uh, sociopath, but it was kind of a thing that a lot of people didn't understand. Is uh, it wasn't a typical sociopath, I guess. But a lot of it, uh, during the interviews that he actually did do, and he did. There's a there's a lot of interviews with him, and uh, he basically said that uh, he felt really horrible for not being able to feel emotion. He could talk to a person, yeah, but he couldn't go into a uh, relationship with somebody because yeah, he lacked the empathy. Yeah, it says here. Um, I mean, he he was older. I mean, quite a bit older than your average run of the mill guy or, or girl that that we've profiled so far. Uh, he was a World War II veteran, and after the war, he tested nuclear weapons at the Pacific Proving Grounds before he went back to California as an electrician. Uh, that, no, that, that wasn't him. I uh, know. Uh, that was his grandfather. Oh, that, yeah. Uh, okay, so that or was his, his dad. father. Yeah, his dad. I'm so sorry. Um, yeah, I see that. Uh, Edmund II, yeah. so his dad. Yeah, because I was looking at it, I was like, wow, wow, this guy yeah, was Yeah, because old, he was but... born in 1948. Right, yeah, okay, there we go. Um, but yeah, he was a big kid when he was born, 13 pounds as a newborn. I'm like, oof. Ooh. You really hope that that was a C-section birth, because if not, oh, man. Mm-mm, nope. That, that whole thing of, uh. Have you ever imagined a uh, watermelon coming out of a... The, the a whole the size of something of a lemon? Yeah. yeah. N- yeah. Mm-mm. Nope. Not even a lemon. That was more or less like the size <sighs> of a, a straw. <laughs> right. I think she's but, a 10 centimeters. Uh, throughout his uh, time before he actually started, his, what ended up starting his uh, killing spree was the basic fact of his mother actually working at the college as a secretary and uh, him getting frustrated with his mother because his mother was one of those uh, overbearing, uh, you have to do it this way or you have to do it that way. And I'm an alcoholic. She You're talking about his mother, yeah. She, yeah I mean, she, was, she was a stone throw of piece of shit. Yeah, uh, I mean, even his dad... Uh, Edmund the second that yes I have been corrected it was the World War II veteran. Um, what does it says here that uh, she she often complained about his his dad's menial electrician job. Um, he later said that suicide suicide missions in wartime and atomic bomb testings were nothing compared to living with her, oh, wow. and that he uh, and that she affected him more than three hundred and ninety six days and nights of fighting on the front did. That, that's saying a lot, especially coming from that generation and being on the forefront of nuclear weapons testings, such as it was back in the day, you know, where we had a lot of the, uh, the open air blast testings, like, uh, the, the ones that were done in Nevada and, uh, well, with the Pacific proving grounds, uh, those were located, um, in, in the Marshall Islands. So, there was, I mean, there was a lot of, you know, uncertainties in that job alone with the nuclear weapons testings, but with just the fighting that, that took place in World War II, just the ferocity of it, just the overall degree of savagery that just 
took place there, you know, not to take away from today's warriors at all. I mean, we've got the body armor and we've got the plates and we, we've got all this technology that helps us in war fighting. Back then, they didn't have it. We had steel helmets that were not ballistic at all. They provided you with just the mean, mean bare minimum necessary protection against things like air blasts from artillery and the occasional grazing round. But for the most part, I mean, the, the guys that fought in World War II, they, they saw the absolute worst that man could possibly do to another man, to up to including the nuclear blast that we dropped on Japan. Yeah, exactly. And even the firebombs in uh, uh, Tokyo and stuff like that. Yeah, uh, uh, or that Dresden, uh, where we firebombed that German city in Dresden. Yeah, yeah. so it's... it's <laughs> yeah, to, to, go, to say that he would rather... You know, that was nothing compared to living with him, you know Kemper's wife or a mother, that says a lot. And you really kind of have to kind of look at her and be like, were you maybe just a little bit more responsible for the way that your son turned up and people are letting on? Because, I mean, it even even back then it was just, it wasn't, I don't want to say politically correct, but, yeah, for lack of a better term, politically correct to look at the mom and be like, it's your fault. You, know, you we can't yeah. do that. And it, it goes goes to the, even through the interviews and everything like that, uh a sociopath doesn't really feel emotion, but he actually felt emotion. Yeah, there's a lot of jilted emotions there. I mean, he, he really kind of felt like he was getting the short end of the stick. Even at age 13, he killed the family cat because he thought that it favored his younger sister over him. Mm, yeah, he, he's still crazy, crazy. And he kept pieces of it in his closet until the mother, you know, until his mom found it. So you can oh, only yeah, imagine still what... still crazy, crazy, but... Yeah, still crazy, crazy, but at that point, you know, we've got, we've got the beginnings of something very evil here. But nobody did anything about it. I mean, the mom probably just chalked it up as, oh, you're just crazy, you know, crazy like your father, and you're going to be some kind of deadbeat. So he's got that going against him. Yeah, I don't know why they didn't grab some holy water and give him the uh, water board. Exercise the demons, yeah. Yeah, water board the demon out of him. That's my new thing. <laughs> <laughs> it even says that he had a dark fantasy life. He performed rites with his younger sister's dolls that culminated in removing their heads and hands. And on one occasion when his elder sister, Susan Hughley Kemper, who died back in 2014, teased him and asked him why, uh, why he did not try to kiss his teacher. He replied, if I kiss her, I'd have to kill her first. That's kind of crazy, crazy. Yeah, yeah oh he'd, he would sneak sneak out of the house <clears throat> and armed with his father's bayonet, go to a second-grade teacher's house to watch her through the windows. Uh, it st stated later in interviews that some of his favorite games to play as a child were gas chamber and electric chair, in which he asked his younger sister to tie him up and flip an imaginary switch. He would then tumble over and writhe on the floor, pretending that he was being executed by gas inhalation or electric shock. Um, also had near-death experiences as a child once when his elder sister tried to push him in front of a train and another time when she successfully pushed him into the deep end of a swimming pool where he almost drowned. So what you're trying to say here is that back then they had a different kind of uh, thinking of uh, how to treat kids and everything. Or how what safe was? Yeah, it's not so much that they had a different idea as to what safe was, but nobody really looked at the kids, you know, as far as like the sisters or the, even the moms of the of the time, as being unstable because, well, you know, my parents were married when they were when I was born, so that makes my parents okay. They did the responsible things, and moms. Oh, my whole family was a shit show. <laughs> the moms. The moms were the idealistic, you know, uh, picture of civility and homemaking. And, you know, they were the ones holding up the home front while dad was off fighting in the war. He actually had a really close relationship with his dad. And he was devastated when they separated in 1957. Yeah. Um, actually, he probably would have turned out, well, maybe, maybe not. If he had gone to live with his dad, he probably would have had a better chance of reigning in those, those, um, well, you know, and let's back up a second, because if he had gone to live with his dad, his dad probably would have put the fear of God into him yeah. and, and had more of a stringent control or hand or handle, rather, of his disciplinary upbringing. 
versus the mom. You know, the mom probably looked at him as a as a direct reminder. No, that was that is exact thing what yeah. happened because uh, she actually said it a couple of times to where uh, she basically said, "You're a reminder of the failure of your father." Yeah. So, and you still see that now. You know, a lot nowadays, it, people just don't really they don't talk about it. Uh, no, where, some of them do. They well, talk they about do. It on Facebook now. Yeah, I mean, because you know it's you know the anonymity of, of the keyboard. Yeah. But with. I mean, you, you see moms, and to a degree, there are dads that do it. But with the moms, especially, they look at it as, especially if they feel like, okay, well, I've wasted years of my life, or this was a mistake, but it took me years to realize it because, for whatever reason, um, we're not going to go down that road. But um, you know, the the mother will look at the parent, will look at the kids, especially if they're sons. If the the mother will look at the sons and say, "Well, I love you. You remind me of your father." So I'm going to I'm going to take things away from you and I'm going to I'm going to I'm going to reflect my piss poor attitude about your other genetic half onto you and that's really detrimental because you I mean you look at it and it's like back then there really wasn't a thing as co-parenting you know I mean divorce became and separation became more of a an accepted thing especially after the war but nobody really, they, they always chalked it up as dad was the deadbeat, dad was the failure, dad this, dad that. And, and I think that really started to signify a paradigm shift in the way that society viewed relationships, society viewed men in the, in the home. Yeah, they're the breadwinner. They're the ones that are supposed to be the workhorse. They're the ones supposed to be bringing home the bacon. That's fine. But nobody ever looked at mom. Nobody ever looked at the female side of the equation. Yeah, while while the men in, in, of of any era had their faults, you know there was always those bad apples that kind of stuck out, but nobody ever looked at the at the women, the 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 matriarchal or archerial side of of the equation. Women, and are, are just as bitter, and in a lot of a lot of cases, you see they're more bitter after a breakup than the men are. And I don't know if that is attributed to the way that men and women think, you know, because men, uh, what is it, so we're, we compartmentalize a lot of things, whereas they say that women, when you look at the way that their brains are wired, it's more like spaghetti. Everything touches and everything's got something to do with the other thing, whereas men are able to compartmentalize things. And that's not, that's not a sexist thing at all. It, it's, it's been written in paper after paper after paper by both members of both genders, you know, all two of them. Um, so I, I think that a lot of what occurred later in his life can really be kind of traced back to the way that his mother viewed him. Or just viewed men in general. It could have been just a men in general thing, but I, I really don't want to kind of throw that blanket statement out there. And that's a broad brush to paint with. I think we can be in this particular case with the documentation that's available for Kemper himself, that Kemper the third that you know we can really we can take that we can we can go from a six inch brush and we can go to a two inch brush and we can really kind of paint we can edge that corner and say a lot of his tendencies and a lot of the way that he behaved his his developed and learned behaviors came from the way that his mother treated him versus his sisters because you don't see anything about their sis his sisters. You know, you don't see anything about the way that they lived their lives or anything like that. They stayed off the radar. Not to say to say not saying that they weren't set up for failure by the way that their mother treated their you know, their brother. But they didn't go off on these huge tangents talking about, you know, you know performing less rights on on sisters' dolls or even murdering the cat because you felt like the cat preferred them over him. And I think a lot of that goes towards, it really kind of lends itself to the idea that without that father figure being present in home, that positive male influence, because let's be honest, you, you've got male, you know, there's always going to be a male presence. Yeah. If, if, if the kids live with the mom, there's always going to be a male presence. And it's debatable as to whether or not the majority of those presences are going to be positive influences. 
Well, that's true enough. I mean, uh, you you will have a lot of times that the mother is uh, an emotional bag of uh, fireworks. Yeah. And uh, a lot of people are taking uh, credit to where it's we're just finding out a lot of the stuff that's uh, that a lot of the stuff that's happening in the human mind. Right. Which. Uh, I will finally get... Okay, there we go. That's perfectly fine. Yeah. But uh, I don't know why my mic does this. Yours is perfect. Well, it's because I'm using it. Yeah, I, I figured as much. But, I mean, like the 50s, the 40s, 50s, and even the 60s, all the way up into the 70s, and and, and I want to say maybe that it's, it's probably now... They'd started touching on it in the 90s and up into the 21st century up to present day. They're only just now recognizing the male emotional state. Um, because yeah, there's a lot of female actual activists that let everybody know. It's like, hey, he's a man. You need to listen to him too. Right. You need to, we, we need to. Uh, there's a couple of people that I, I follow on YouTube that do uh, TikTok, and she does it every. Uh, she has a TikTok. I, I I wish I knew her name. I just think she's hot, and I just started <laughs> listening to her. It's one of those things. It's like, would you listen to me if I was ugly? Probably not. I think I've seen those videos. What is she's all tattooed and everything like that? Uh, yeah. I just I can't think of her username off the top of my head either. But, yeah. but uh, back to the killings. I I can't believe we have to say that. But uh, back to the killings. <laughs> uh. Uh, the first victims were Marianne uh, uh, Pesco, Pesky? Pesky. Mm -hmm. and Anna uh, Lazesta. Uh, Kemper ended up driving uh, driving into Berkeley when he picked up uh, two 18-year-old hitchhikers, uh, students from Fresno State University. Uh, Mary Ann and... Uh, uh, Mary Ann and Anta Marie. Man, that is just... That's weird. I just looked at those names and it's... The whole whole thing, just the flip of the uh, names kind of right. messed with me. Uh, with the pretense of uh, taking them to Stanford. After driving for an hour, sh he managed to reach a secluded wooded area near uh, Ameland, California, with which he was familiar from his work at uh, the highway department without alerting his passengers that he had changed direction from uh, the where they wanted to go. It was there that he handcuffed uh, Pesco, Pesky, and Locke listening in the trunk. What is really amazing about this uh, this scene right here, that if you can imagine, uh, Ed Kemper really is. Uh, what, would, what, what would be the word where a person uh, towards the opposite sex is very like tempered to the point where he accidentally uh brushed up against one of the uh, victim's breast and he's he like apologized he's like hey i'm sorry i didn't really mean to do that i want to say the word docile docile there we yeah. go uh he was really docile to the point where he he literally he brushed against one of their breasts and he was embarrassed and he he was like oops i'm sorry and then he killed her like minutes later yeah i mean if you think about the uh, weirdness of that whole situation that you know you're gonna do horrible things to this person's body yeah. when they're dead but when they're alive you can't do it I think that's I, I think that was <clears throat> on two different fronts one he was setting them up with a like a false sense of security like oh this guy's pretty harmless and they let their guard down uh, the other part of it is that he didn't respect the body uh, you know, for what it was, which was a vessel, you know, and then with the the apologetic nature that he had with the accidental brushing, the accidental contact, he was showing the living being, the living person there, he was being he was respectful of those boundaries. But I think that once the body, you know, once the person left the body, the body was fair game. I think that that's the way he was looking at it. Yeah, I was about to disagree with you on the first part about uh, 
uh, the false sense of security. And then I just remember from the interview that he actually said that. Mm -hmm. It was like he gave people false sense of security. And basically, he was like, I'm going to murder you. I'm going to treat you as nice as possible. And then I'm going to ruin your whole entire way people view you. Mm -hmm. and that's what ended up happening. Uh, his next victim was a 50-year-old dance student named, I'm going to butcher the holy hell out of this, Akio Ku. Akio Ku, that, that, hey, I'm going with that, yeah. Okay, okay. Uh, who had decided to hitchhike uh, to a dance class after meeting her, uh, missing her bus. Uh, he drove again to the remote area, pulled the gun on Kum uh, before accidentally locking himself out of his car. However, Ku let him back inside. That's how ridiculous his, this story is. Uh, he literally was, was the epitome of showing them, I'm a nice person, I'm not going to do anything to you. He locked his keys in the car. And they still are like, okay, you might be safe. Oh, wait a minute. I'm gonna... that's, that's the, that is just wow. It's yeah, just, wow. but a lot of that too. You know, you, we don't we don't know what the um, the conversation entailed. He might have tried to try to play it off. I'll have to get back to that person later. But like, look, dude, you know. But um, <laughs> anyways, we're keeping that. Um, <laughs> With an IQ of 145, and I'm going to keep going back to that, because with that with that high of an IQ, that can, that degree of intelligence, there has to be. Do you think he had mentally uh, mental powers, like he was telepathy? Or I don't think it was. I don't. I don't. I don't think it was that. I, I think that he had a very unique and ornate gift. He was able to sell ice to an Eskimo, or you know. So, Most of these serial killers actually have that, though. Yeah, I mean, they're very persuasive. I mean, they, they, they have this very high degree of charm. Unlike, like, Eileen Warnos, I mean, she just used her body. You know, let's let's prey on the uh, the simpler, car you know, uh, carnal instincts of man just to kind of lure them in. And then whenever she felt like they were being a dick, she plugged them. But with this guy, he had a place that he liked to go. He had a very specific M.O., where he would take them out to these remote areas and really kind of put the, the, the victims at ease. And if something kind of went a little off track, if, you know, if, if, if he made a mistake like locking himself out of the car, he would convince these people that it was okay to, let, you know, to, to unlock the car or to, to aid him in, in fixing a mistake. So I, I think that with the information that we have, I think that the the, the ludicrous nature of, of these stories really be, kind of becomes clarified if we had all the facts. So, I mean, what, what was being said during that conversation when you're talking through the window of your locked car? You know, are you, are you reassuring her that nothing's going to happen? Are you just, I'm going to take you back. I'm sorry. This was a mistake. This won't happen. And then as soon as she lets him back in, bam, she's gone. And then he's, what, packing her into the trunk of his car? So he, he choked her unconscious, he raped her, and he killed her. So to me, I think even then with, with what he was done, you know, I mean, because he was, he said, subsequently packed her into the trunk of his car, went to a nearby bar to have a few drinks, returned to his apartment, and then he later confessed after exiting the bar, he opened up his trunk and he admired his catch like a fisherman. Um, back at his apartment, he would then defile the corpse again. So uh, he did, dismembered and disposed of the remains in similar manner as the previous two victims. Ku's mother called the police to report the disappearance of her daughter and put up hundreds of flyers asking for information, but she didn't receive any responses regarding her daughter's location or status. So I think given at the time, like if we'd had social media back then, she would have gotten some information. Even if they were like false leads, you know, she would have gotten something. But given the time constraints, or not time constraints, the constraints of the time, you know, you weren't going to get anything. Because, uh, I mean, this guy was smart. I mean, he, he would pick people up, 
that were in certain situations, in certain scenarios. Mostly hitchhikers. Mostly hitchhikers. And he did that because of the isolation that that type of scenario provided. Yep. It was a built-in anonymity. Uh, next one was Cindy Shaw. Yeah. Uh, Capra, Capra Low Campus. Mm-hmm. Man, I... I, I went Calibrio. over this. Yeah, Calabrio. I went over these things with a fine tooth comb to try to uh, figure out how to. And I'm sticking an L in there, so yeah. yeah. So, uh, Cabri- Cabrillo College. There we go. Yeah. Uh, when he picked up an 18 year old student, uh, Cindy, uh, he drove to the wooded area, fi- uh, fiddly shot her in the uh, uh, head, uh, placed her body in the trunk, drove uh, to his mom's house, and he kept it in a closet uh, room overnight. When his mom left for work, he would sexually intercourse with and remove the bullet from uh, Cindy's corpse, and then dismembered and decapitated uh, her in her mother's uh, tub. He kept se- uh, he kept the, se- uh, the severed head, regularly engaging in ero- he, he a romano and yeah, in romano yeah. Uh, then buried it in his mother's garden, faced upward towards her bedroom. After his arrest, he stated that. He did this because his mother's always wanted people to look up at her. God. That. That's dark. Mm. Yeah. um, So he discarded the rest of her remains by throwing them off a cliff. Uh, Over the course of a few weeks, all but her head and right hand were discovered and pieced together like a macrobe jigsaw puzzle. The pathologist determined that she had been cut into pieces with a power saw. Yeah, but moving on, uh, Rosalind, Rosalind Thorpe and Allison Liu. On February 5th, 73, after a heated argument with his mother, he left the house in search of possible victims. That statement right there alone, I mean, how could you not look at the mom and say, you're responsible for this guy being the way that he is? Yes, while we have argued in the past that everybody has the, the power of free will, I think that after a certain point, but just the constant berating. Yeah, that that's that's one thing about uh, this guy that was really uh, that hands down. It was it was fifty fifty half his mother's fault and half his fault because she mm-hmm. was a shitbag human being and right. he ended up becoming more of a shitbag human being. And we'll get into the last last days. And I'll give you some good information on that. Yeah, because you start seeing that that he's bringing them back to his mom's house, where he would do these things to these bodies. And I don't know if that was maybe an act of defiance against his mother, you know, or what. It's either that or it's incredibly ballsy, because with the opinion that his mom had of him, if she'd have had any kind of inkling that this stuff was going on inside of her house. She would have turned him in in a heartbeat. I mean, you would think. Yeah. Uh, another thing that uh, he said is, like, head head trip fantasies were a bit of, uh, like, trophies. You know, the head is where everything is at, the brain, the eyes, the mouth. That's the person. I remember being told as a kid, you cut off the head and the body dies. The body is nothing after the head is cut off. Well... That's not quite true. There's a lot left in a girl's body without the head. That was one of his uh, uh, explanations why he kept the head. Yeah. And, wow, just... Just just from that statement alone, you kind of get a, a, a peek into his mindset. And you're just like, dude, <laughs> they shouldn't have let you out when you turned 21. These, these psychiatrists should have been doing their job, and it sounds to me like they allowed themselves to get duped. Well, if you actually look at it, most of these guys are actually, uh, they've been in prison for a little bit, and then they get out. And, and that happens a lot. Yeah. If uh, Throughout these serial killers and everything like that, you'll you'll see that most of them have actually, uh, only in a case point of uh, Vicky John Johnson. Mm-hmm. That's the reason why I, uh, I did her one. It's more local for us. But it was also the fact of... Um, she was one of the one people that was never arrested. She was really, truly a nice, nice person. And then just one day she snapped. Yeah. But most of these people that actually got arrested, 
uh, I would have to divvy into because uh, uh, of what the people were like. Like the one that we were supposed to do with the two kids where they tortured that other kid. I couldn't find any kind of information because, well, it's two kids. You, and most of the stuff is uh, sealed up. Sealed yeah. up, yeah. But uh, the last two, after coming home from a party, 52-year-old Camille uh, Elizabeth Stranho- uh, Strandberg awakened her son with her arrival. While sitting in her bed reading a book, he noticed Kemper entering her room and said to, uh, said to him, I suppose you're going to want to sit up and talk. Kemper replied, no, good night. And he wanted then... No, wait. No good, good night. He then uh, waited for her to fall asleep, returned to... Uh, bludgeoned her with a claw hammer, slitting her throat with a knife. He uh, decapitated her and engaged in... Uh, Your motto, yeah. That's a fancy where I know what it is. I had to look it up uh, with her severed head. Then used uh, used it as a dartboard. Dart came right there. That would, that would yeah, he stated that he put her head on a shelf and screamed at it for an hour, then threw darts at it and ultimately smashed her face in. He also cut out her tongue and larynx and put them in a garbage disposal. However, the garbage disposal could not break down the tough vocal cords and ejected the tissue back into the sink. That seemed appropriate, Kemper later stated, and as much as she bitched and screamed and yelled at me over so many years. So, yeah. What's really strange on, uh, what when we go back to the interviews that actually happened in the 80s after uh, all this is done, uh, after the murder of his mother, he turned himself in. Yeah. And he base he he wanted the death penalty. He was willing to go. Uh, he he told the cops everything. He wanted everything to stop. He even said uh, in the interview that before he killed his mother, he wanted to test himself to see if he could stop killing. He like picked up a couple of people, drove them out, drove them to the location, made sure they got there, and left. He wanted to make sure. He he wanted to see if he was actually capable of stopping himself, which he was, I don't know, mm-hmm. but he still needed to uh, take judgment for what he actually did, and that's what he wanted. He wanted uh, people to judge him for what he did because he felt bad. He knew he was doing wrong, and uh, he, and even in the interview, he called, uh, he cried because he killed his mother and how he did it and everything. He was literally like... And this is what does, I, I don't get that if he was a sociopath or not, or if it was an act, that he, he bawled his eyes out because he literally, he's like, who does this? Yeah. What kind of person does this? Yeah, I mean, he even killed his mom's best friend. Because um, after he stashed his mom's cl- body in the closet, he went to, a, went to drink at a nearby bar. Uh, when he came back, he invited his mom's best friend, 59-year-old Sarah Taylor Hallett, over to the house to have dinner and watch a movie. When she arrived, he strangled her to death to create a cover story that his mother and Hallett had gone away together on vacation. He uh, then put her corpse in a closet, obscured any outside, outward signs of a disturbance, and left a note to the police, and it read, Approximately 5.15 a.m. Saturday. No need for her to suffer anymore at the hands of this horrible mur- or murderous butcher. It was quick, asleep, the way I wanted it. Not sloppy and incomplete, gents. Just a lack of time. I got things to do. I mean, that's that's kind of removed. I mean, like, he, he's trying to justify it, but then he turns around and just very coldly, very sociopathically just kind of goes... I got things to do, so I needed this one to be quick. It was almost like it was inconvenient for him to have to murder her, but he did it in a way that didn't affect his schedule. Yeah. And uh, his actual counsel uh, wanted him to plead uh, not guilty by reason of insanity, and Kemper twice tried to commit suicide in custody. I mean, he really felt bad for what he did. Yeah. But am I... uh, it's one of those things it's I can understand it I just it's one of the man I really can't just 
it, it's one of those th- it's one of those things you're you know in the back of your mind I was like oh he's really nice but he will eat you it's like it's like hanging out with like a grizzly bear it's nice and everything until he actually is hungry yeah and he will freaking rip you to shreds which that's that's one one thing that actually uh, a lot of these serial killers people don't understand is yeah they seem nice yes they're they're humble at times and some some of them are humble some of them are just egotistical assholes but they're caged lions and every once in a while someone opens up the cage yeah and it's mostly uh, mostly them. He's still alive. He's still in prison. Uh, he's still serving his sentence. Uh, uh, he was supposed to get the death penalty, but California waived it out at that time, and they didn't re-case him, so he couldn't reinstate to be in the death penalty. So. Yeah, I, you know, <clears throat> I think the time that he's been kept, uh, you know, alive. Uh, has really served to be a good thing. Uh, he's even being viewed as a model prisoner because he's kept in general population. But uh, it says here, you know, Kemper is forthcoming about the nature of his crimes and has stated that he had participated in interviews to save others like himself from killing. So he's like, there's somebody out there that is watching this and hasn't done that, hasn't killed people, and wants to, and rages inside and struggles with what that, with that feeling, or is so sure that they have it under control, they need to talk to somebody about it. Trust somebody enough to sit down and talk about something that isn't a crime. Thinking that way isn't a crime. Doing it isn't act, isn't just a crime. It's a horrible thing. It doesn't know when to quit, and it can't be stopped easily once it starts. So, I don't, you know, I don't know if this is so much him just being the smart guy that he is, or if it's actual empathy and compassion and remorse creeping into that psyche and trying to gain a foothold. And it appears to be that on the surface. Now, whether it's just, you know, that's his true motivation or not, we don't know. I mean, but the guy is going to be in jail for the rest of his natural life. I mean, it's just because, one, California doesn't have the death penalty anymore, and I mean, jurisdictional lines being drawn the way that they are, they're not going to extradite him to a state that they can go stick a needle in his arm. I mean, the guy is serving out the rest of his life in, behind bars, but he's cooperating with authorities and on, on a lot of different fronts. Well, that was the base of uh, Mindhunter. Where the uh, FBI was trying to do uh, uh, serial killer profiles because it was a new thing mm-hmm. right then and there after yeah. the height of the serial killers and everything like that. And I don't know if the uh, if the TV show is true. There's a lot of dramatization of it and everything like that. I don't know if the FBI actually talked to Ed Kemper personally to get. Uh, information and why he killed and everything like that but it's an interesting thought yeah I and mean, he he does do a lot of interviews and everything and, and he literally says it's like i really hope nobody does what i do right but uh on that note uh i think our next person that we'll do uh is the bt BTK killer, mm-hmm. which uh, was actually in uh, in Mine Hunter. He was the one they were trying to find and everything. Right, and he's he he's another guy that was the uh, guy next door that was really nice and everything, and he was a he was a crap bag. But uh, that's it for today. I'm David Dickerman. I'm Johnny Skelton, and this is Psychos and Sociopaths. See you next time, people. Don't kill anybody. <laughs> Yeah, okay. That's getting edited out.